Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ingo Wolf and I'm the chairman of the America House here in Cologne. I'm welcoming you to the Otto Wolf Lecture in honor of the transatlanticist Otto Wolf von Ammerungen and Alfred von Oppenheim. I would have preferred to welcome you personally. However, due to the coronavirus, we unfortunately had to choose a pure Zoom format. Concerning the following discussion, I will limit myself to a brief introduction. First and foremost, my special greetings go out to Secretary Condoleezza Rice, who is joining us from the Stanford University campus tonight. I would like to thank Klaus Brinkbäumer in Hamburg, an award-winning journalist and author of several books, who will introduce Secretary Rice and moderate the discussion. Last but not least, I would love to welcome Consul Kelly Merrick, our honorary chairwoman, Baroness von Oppenheim, Dr. Franz Schoser, chair of the Otto Wolf Foundation, and all members, friends, and the managing team of the America House and the worldwide audience via Zoom. More than 300 people have registered for tonight's event. Enjoy this evening, and I'll hand over to Mr. Brinkbäumer. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. And it is my honor to introduce Secretary Rice to you, dear ladies and gentlemen. Condoleezza Rice, um, as you may know, is an excellent pianist, but even, of course, better known because of politics. She was the 66th uh, United States Secretary of State from 2005 to 2009, working for the second uh, Bush administration, George W. Bush. And before that, from 2001 until 2005, she was National Security Advisor in the first George, uh, George W. Bush administration. And she was immediately thrown into a very different world after 9-11. Academically, Condoleezza Rice received a PhD from the School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And today, she is a professor in global business and the economy. She's a senior fellow at, uh, on public policy at the Hoover Institution and a professor of political science, the School of Humanities and Sciences, all that at Stanford. Condoleezza Rice, you are in Stanford right now. Secretary Rice, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to join you for this very important conversation about the transatlantic relationship. Um, I, I want to start by uh, congratulating us on the transatlantic relationship. There is so much doom and gloom these days, but let's remember how successful this relationship has really been. Uh, in the past 70 to 75 years, uh, we avoided a major war. I, I wonder if in 1946 or 1947, or certainly in 1949, when the Soviet Union exploded a nuclear weapon five years ahead of schedule, if anyone would have said that we would avoid major war, but we did. Secondly, uh, we were strong together for the 45 years or so after that, uh, providing a space in which uh, free peoples could uh, prosper and democratic governments could be formed on the western side of the divide. And in that way, Germany is itself quite a miracle. Um, when you think about uh, the defeated and devastated Germany of 1945, uh, one has to remark at how people like Konrad Adenauer and, and others who saw a future for a Germany uh, that would not be uh, Germany broken and, uh, and held to defeat as after World War I, but rather a democratic Germany that could be strong and could be a part of a democratic alliance, uh, first within the European Union, so that there would never be again war between France and Germany, but also with a strong relationship with the United States that truly believed in what political scientists call the democratic peace. Democracies don't fight with one another. And then, of course, uh, we would wait many years until Germany could be unified. One of the great moments for me was that I was actually a part of the White House team the, the, of George H.W. Bush uh, that dealt with German unification, peacefully unified, uh, completely, in ter and com uh, completely and totally on Western terms, uh, the Eastern part integrated again into a democratic Germany. And of course, we have to look at Eastern Europe 
which would then uh, also be integrated into a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, that is a story that uh, had you told that story in 1945 or 1946, no one would have believed it. And it is very much because there was wise leadership, but there were also powerful institutions that reflected our democratic values, that understood that our interests were completely linked to those values, and that kept us strong despite the challenges of the Soviet Union and all that we would face. Now, that success, of course, cannot be taken for granted going forward. There are several, several challenges now to the transatlantic relationship. Uh, let me start with what happened with Britain and Brexit. Um, how do we think about a transatlantic relationship when Britain is not the bridge between uh, the United States and continental Europe? Uh, you know, it is a special relationship uh, with, British, with the British. I, I often say to my British friends, we've gotten over that unpleasantness of 1776 now uh, to be friends and allies, but the fact that Britain was a part of the European Union, I think made that European Union look toward across the Atlantic. And so one of the challenges is that uh, the European Union continues to have an outward looking focus, uh, not just one that is continental in its character. I have great confidence actually that it will because uh, our relationship with Germany is a powerful and strong relationship, uh, but it will now have to carry along with France some of the weight of making sure that the European Union is a European Union that has a strong relationship with the United States. We have, of course, challenges that there is a deterioration of democracy in some of the East Central European countries that were early to join the Europe whole and free. I speak principally of Hungary, of course, uh, where the challenges of uh, authoritarianism, the um, worries that um, Orban and his, uh, his friends will overturn democratic institutions. Um, there's a saying that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And certainly we're seeing uh, this in Hungary. There are problems in Poland, of course. But it seems to me that Polish institutions have been more resilient than we might have thought just a few years ago. We have, of course, all of us face a challenge of the rise of populism. Uh, we, what do populists do? It's not that populists are anti-democratic, but they are anti-institutional. They believe that the leader goes directly to the people. Now, the American founders understood that the passions of the people needed to be channeled, needed to go through representative governments, needed to go through constitutions, needed to go through courts and rule of law. And so the challenge is to take away from populists the, um, the belief that they can go directly to the people and say to the people, these global elites, they don't have your interest at heart. They are just trying to make you poor. And wherever you go, in Europe or the United States or Latin America for that matter, you will find populists of this kind. And it's a real challenge to all of us, but it's a challenge to the transatlantic relationship. There's a challenge of China, a rising China, that does not share our values and increasingly does not share our interests. And here, I would caution my own country in how we think about this. We don't need loyalty tests for our allies about how they will deal with China. I would trust that our values and our interests are completely linked. I do not believe when I read that Europe is somehow tilting toward China. I just don't believe it. There are commercial relationships with China. Uh, Europeans will not want to be in a hostile relationship with China, but neither should we want to be in a hostile relationship with China. We do have to recognize that Xi Jinping is a different kind of leader. 
The wolf warrior diplomacy is assertive and aggressive. China is assertive and aggressive in its economic affairs and in its military posture. But we can work together if we don't demand a loyalty oath on the part of our allies. We also have the challenge of the US role. Americans are a bit tired. I take some responsibility that for that myself because I, I often said to President Bush, I think we've exhausted people. After 9-11, there, there was the fight against terrorism and there was vigilance and, and there were wars that President Trump came to power calling them endless wars that had to be ended. And if you think this is just President Trump, I would suggest that you read the final uh, interview between uh, Barack Obama and Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic. It sounds an awful lot like a law professor speaking like Donald Trump. Those allies, they got me into that stupid war in Libya, and then they didn't even have enough ammunition. Americans are a bit tired. Allies are going to have to step up. And that means the 2% in NATO, 2% expenditure, but it also means in places like Nagorno-Karabakh, where is Europe to help with issues like that? With Vladimir Putin, to be sure that we continue to show him and challenge him to say, Article 5 is for real. Don't even think about it with the Baltic states. And when Ukraine happened, I think we did other, actually rather well in sanctions against uh, Russia that have continued to hold. Finally, there's the challenge of just young people. They don't remember. I am a university professor, and sometimes after more than 30 years on the Stanford faculty, I'm surprised at what they don't remember. I said to my class uh, not too long ago, a young woman kept referring in her presentation, she kept referring to Brezhnev, Brezhnev, Brezhnev. And I thought, why does she not know that his name is Brezhnev? She probably never heard it. <laughs> and I finally said to them, how many of you were born when the Soviet Union collapsed? Not a single one of them. We have to somehow restore in our young people a sense of the transatlantic values that got us to where we are today. I know that America House, for instance, was, was formed with the idea, not that governments needed it, but that people needed it. That people-to-people -people relationships, the Fulbright scholars, the people who study in our universities, the people who get to know each other through cultural exchange. If I could make one strong plea for the transatlantic relationship, it would be not to take it for granted. We have so many big issues. However different our views of privacy, for instance, and technology, those differences pale in comparison to our differences with China. However different we may view supplies for energy, all of us need to work together on climate change. However we view the Russians and what they're doing, none of us wants to see a repeat of Georgia, a Crimea. And so we have a lot of work to do together. Let's not take for granted the successes of the past, but keep building on them so that 40 years from now, or 50 years from now, or 70 years from now, our successors will be sitting in these chairs and saying, we've been highly successful. We owe to those who made those successes possible after World War II to make sure that we continue to build on them and sustain them in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary Rice. Now you, I'm sure you would hear the applause, which I cannot hear, but it's there. It must be there. Um, I'm going to ask questions now. And of course, I'm trying. Uh, sorry, we just had a little power something here. I'll be right back. Thank you anymore. I'm almost Zoom, yes. <laughs> It's dark in California. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I, 
I was worried for a moment that with all the power outages, yeah, we, yeah. Had, we had just had one, but no, it's just apparently you have to move around in this room. <laughs> uh, it's a nine hour time difference right now, isn't it? It's, uh, yes, 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 it's yeah. daylight here. <laughs> daylight, it's early morning, okay. <laughs> and I'm trying to add in to work in questions which should reach me via the chat and uh, from our listeners. So I'll try to add those in and try to, to, mark it, to make it flow. Um, to specify on what you just uh, talked about, um, expressing your expectations concerning Europe, what, ex what ex especially do you expect from Germany? What role should and can Germany have? I really do believe that uh, with the exception of Great Britain, uh, the United States has its closest relationship in many ways with Germany. Um, I think it is a part of our history. When I think about how uh, American presidents at, in those early stages, like Truman, um, thought about how to rebuild Germany, they believed like the German leadership that was emerging, Adenauer, and that would go all the way through, uh, whether it was social democratic or, or Christian democratic, that believed that Germany uh, had overcome its past and Germany could be a democratic pillar, that you didn't have to think about balance of power. You only had to think about a balance of power that favored freedom. And I think Germany was the beneficiary of that, but also a tremendous partner in that. And so I would hope that Germany uh, would go out of its way to be that voice within the European Union that when we have our differences, and we will, we've had our differences, we had them during the Cold War, we had them, if people remember about pipelines, uh, we're still fussing about pipelines. Um, we, uh, but when it came to really important decisions, Germany stood by. That decision in 1979 uh, to go ahead uh, with the um, Pershing II deployments uh, that made a huge difference. We now know from reading the Soviet um, archives at the time, uh, the Soviet Union had thought it could split Germany and the United States. And when it couldn't, it realized that it was not going to be able to continue at the level of Cold War that it had been. And that helped to bring Gorbachev with a different kind of policy, the new thinking in foreign policy. So I would say to Germans, when we stick together, we get amazing benefits from it. And so uh, I would hope Germany could be that voice within the European Union. And also that Germany could uh, be a factor, uh, as it has been in Ukraine, in doing some of the hard diplomacy uh, that still has to be done. Would you say that Germany is um, feeling comfortable not really doing enough, that Germany is in fact taking advantage of the US or maybe put it in a more, in a, in a nicer way, that Germany feels it should hold itself back because of its history? I have thought a lot about this question. Um, how much is uh, history a problem for a more assertive German uh, foreign policy? And uh, perhaps it was there, uh, but I, I actually think that, uh, you, that it doesn't seem to me to be as much a factor today. Um, Germany should be and is a confident uh, power, large economy, unified, strong, uh, to the degree that Germany has any reservations about acting, I would say, please get over them. We need you. Um, we trust those democratic values. I remember President George H.W. Bush was asked uh, by a journalist, um, should Germany unify? He said, yes, and as quickly as Germans want to. And somebody said, then how, but how can you trust Germany? And he said that he had visited as vice president and that there had been protests against him. And he thought German democracy is alive and well. And so German democracy is alive and well. We, we need a strong German voice uh, in foreign policy. I'm sure you are familiar with um, doubts that are all over Germany, actually. 
going the other way, going towards the United States, um, because of course we hear um, your current president, um, be, and he's very aggressive towards uh, Chancellor Merkel. He's aggressive towards Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. He's um, he's aggressive um, in the direction of France, Macron, and he's nicer if it if it comes to uh, to Putin and Russia. So in Germany, there are doubts whether the United States really still believe in these transatlantic relations you so wonderfully described, but is it still there? Do the United States still believe in those relations? Do they still really believe in democracy itself? Well, the United States certainly believes in democracy. Um, I, I have students who say, oh, socialism. And I say to them, the only time from each uh, according to his talents, to each according to his needs. The only time that's worked is at gunpoint. And it's actually never motivated anybody, and so it's failed every time. And I think this is, again, uh, sometimes our young people just don't, they're just frankly ignorant of what socialism is and, and uh, how it has uh, failed so many times. So yes, they believe in democracy. You're about to see Americans vote in record numbers. People believe in their democracy. People go, the administration too? Yes, people go into the streets to protest because they believe in democracy. They want us to be better. Uh, we're a vibrant uh, democracy and our institutions are strong. Um, the Congress uh, sometimes doesn't get things done and sometimes it does. And oh, by the way, our courts are strong. Uh, Americans believe that the American Constitution is their personal protection, and they will take you all the way to the Supreme Court if they think you, they, you violated their rights. We are the most constitutionalist people on the face of the earth, so we'll be just fine. As to the president, the president is a contrarian. If I say yes, he will say no, because that's, that's who he is. And uh, he likes to make waves. He likes sometimes to stir things up. Now, uh, personally, I believe that Chancellor Merkel is one of the great leaders of the last 50 years. I have enormous respect and admiration for her and for all that she has done. Um, I do think that the relationship is strong, even if there's sometimes maybe personal tensions between leaders. Um, I will tell you something else, um, and I, I hesitate to say this in a German audience, but you know that I'm a musician. Uh, there is a saying that is attributed to Mark Twain that Wagner's music was better than it sounded. Now, I happen to love Wagner, but Trump's foreign policy is better than it sounds. If you look at what we did, for instance, in putting heavy brigades into Poland and into the Baltic states with Americans in them, which says to the Russian leadership, if you attack, you're going to have to kill an American to do it. Now, Article 5, an attack upon one is an attack upon all. We never depended just on the words of the American president. We had a tripwire in Germany for decades, because we wanted the Soviets to know if you were going to attack Germany, you had to kill an American to do it. So I would give the Trump administration a lot of credit for that. I would give them credit for arming Ukraine. Uh, we should have armed Ukraine a long time ago so that the Ukrainians could make the Russians pay a price for what they were doing in eastern Ukraine. And so I'll just say, I think the foreign policy may be better than it sounds because the president can be something of a contrarian. But the one place that he's not contrarian, by the way, every American president, every American secretary of state, every American secretary of defense has gone to Brussels and said, please pay your 2%. I might not have said what this president said, which is we won't defend you if you don't pay, but Europe needs to take seriously the fact that America needs help. Yes, definitely. And uh, that is true. I've heard that 2% uh, comment before. And also in Germany, some people say that Trump just turned away from Germany, which is not true. Uh, the, the United States um, turned towards Asia and towards China under the Obama administration. And even before, there, there was a shift happening before. But the, the Trump administration um, 
is very close to some uh, autocracies and seems to be turning away from their traditional partners like Germany or France, or don't you agree with that? No, I don't think so. Um, if you just, again, I would encourage people to look at the policies. Uh, we, uh, whatever the president may say about Xi Jinping, we have the toughest policies against China that we've had in several decades, including tariffs which uh, personally I think we've overused the tariffs, but this president has gone after the Chinese on their industrial policy and their, their economic behavior. Uh, this president went after Huawei um, and said that uh, no one should put Huawei into their 5G networks because they are an agent of the Chinese Communist Party. I happen to agree with that. Uh, this president, uh, I mentioned already the hard things we've done about uh, the, uh, the Russians. And so if you actually look at the policies, uh, they've been pretty tough, even if sometimes the president may sound a little bit like he's got a little bit of envy of those authoritarians. Um, when it comes to the policies, uh, we've been pretty tough. Let's include uh, the audience for first quick round of questions. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, if it's German or English, Stephanie Even or Stephanie Even. Secretary Rice, what is your opinion on the planned US troop drawdown from Germany and its impact on transatlantic relations? Because we are right there at that, at that topic. Yes. Um, I, I don't like the way that this was announced. Um, if this should have been after significant consultation. We should have worked within NATO uh, about it because it affects NATO. But I do think we have to recognize that um, given the state of the uh, international, uh, of international um, security at this point, um, maybe it is time for some rearrangement of American forces, including some drawdown from Germany. Um, now, again, I think you can do this in a way that doesn't call into question whether you're still devoted to the relationship. So I will give you a very good example. When we got to office in 2001, uh, before 9-11 happened, uh, Don Rumsfeld uh, wanted to uh, think about restructuring our force posture in, uh, in South Korea. And uh, we did it in coordination with the South Koreans. Nobody ever really heard much about it. But we made significant changes in the way that we restructured those forces because we didn't need the same force structure. Uh, we're, we were heavy land oriented. That's also true of our troops in Europe. Uh, and so I think a restructuring of those uh, that force posture uh, is probably overdue, uh, but it was not done in a way that, um, that said the right thing about the importance of the relationship, that I admit. Mm -hmm. um, another question on foreign policy from uh, Stephanie Intfein. I hope I pronounce it uh, the correct way. Would you please illustrate your country's values as opposed to uh, alleged values of China by telling us how you assess the situation of Julian Assange? Ah, yes. Well, um, I think that Julian Assange uh, committed multiple uh, crimes. And um, so uh, in the United States, um, I would be very happy if he wished to face the American court system, which I think is fair and uh, unbiased, and um, people can trust that you will get a fair hearing. Uh, I would not say the same about Chinese cult courts. And so whenever I'm asked um, about anything having to do with a controversial figure, I would say uh, come to the United States and uh, go through our court system and you'll get a fair hearing because that's who we are. Um, the Chinese uh, will even admit that they need to do some reform of their court system. Uh, Hu Jintao told us a number of years ago that they had 186,000 riots in one year. Why? Because somebody, a party leader, and uh, had, had seized uh, some peasant's land uh, for himself. The peasant didn't have any recourse to a court, and so he and his friends rioted. So um, rule of law is absolutely the foundation of democracy. And we have difficulties. The racial issues that have emerged around police uh, policing in the United States 
Um, I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. I can tell you that when I was a child, uh, a, a black man, man being killed by the police would not have been a footnote in the newspaper. And now you have people out protesting to say that that isn't fair justice. So we have several checks. One is I think our court system is fair, but whenever Americans feel that justice isn't fair, they will speak up about it and they will protest. And so I think we're safe in terms of our values. Do you criticize the president for not really distancing himself from white supremacists in a way that, that seems more substantial maybe? Well, I think he says that he has. I, I would like to hear him say it more forcefully, absolutely. Um, I also think it's awfully important not to over um, estimate white supremacists in the United States. There are not that many of them. Most Americans don't want to go back to those days. Uh, most Americans are embarrassed by the Confederacy. Um, there's a reason that I wouldn't have any Confederate monuments. They tried to destroy the country. They were traitors. So why would we name our military bases after them? And so, um, yes, I, I would like to hear the president speak more strongly about it. He says that he has. Uh, but uh, you're not going to, I, quite apart from what some may say, you're not actually going to win elections in America by uh, supporting white supremacists. You're going to win elections in America by showing Americans that you can make their economic uh, circumstances better, uh, that you can defeat this virus, and that everybody has a fair chance. That's how you, uh, that's how you win elections with Americans, not with uh, some notion of a, of a past that most people are very happy to see have gone. It's a very interesting point you're making. Um, the writer Tanahisi Coates, um, after Donald Trump's election, wrote that it wasn't a coincidence that Donald Trump was elected after the first African American president. He called Donald Trump the first white president. Um, and he didn't mean literally white. Of course, there were prior presidents being white before him. But he meant uh, there was an element of racism that carried Trump towards the presidency. If I understand you correctly, you don't agree. No, and you know what's very funny about that? A lot of people who voted for Donald Trump voted for Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah. They can't simultaneously be racist and not racist. So what happened? Um, Donald Trump appealed to people who believed they'd been left behind. That's who he appealed to. And he appealed to people in uh, the Rust Belt mm -hmm. where jobs had gone away He did appeal to some people who believed that their culture was being, um, was being mocked by elites. Uh, it doesn't help to say people are clinging to their Bibles and their guns. I grew up in Alabama. They have Bibles and they have guns. And so, yes, um, there was a cultural appeal. But it was in part a cultural appeal that uh, resonated because elites talked about these people as if they were quote unquote, as one candidate said, deplorables. Would you then go and vote for that person? That's what Donald Trump appealed to. But it's very interesting that an awful lot of those people had voted for Barack Obama mm -hmm. just before that. So you can't have it both ways. Um, I will say it was very interesting, Klaus, when, when uh, after the two, six, 2016 elections, the most popular book in the United States was called Hillbilly Elegy. Mm -hmm. And it was about those people um, in places like Alabama, my home state. And my colleagues in the academy had an almost anthropological view. Let's go and see what those people think. Part of the problem is that we as Americans don't have enough common experiences anymore. Uh, we don't serve in the military. As a matter of fact, uh, increasingly, if you're not from the South and your family didn't serve in the military, you won't. Uh, and then um, I believe we need uh, national service so that people will go to places that they otherwise wouldn't be to meet each other. We, uh, and this is a problem that I'm sure you have in Germany as well. Social media has made it so I actually never have to talk to anyone who I disagree with 
because I can go to my cable news channels, my bloggers, my websites, and I don't encounter people who think differently or live differently. So I think that's the problem. Uh, yes, are there people who see race? Race is very deep in America. We all see race. We are not colorblind. Do most Americans want to act on that? No. And so um, I think people of goodwill can overcome these differences. My experience throughout the last two years um, were that the United States seemed to be deeper divided and more polarized than they were before, even though, of course, there were years of polarization and a deep divide um, in the American history. But uh, the two parties really have problems getting things done in Washington, D.C., working on, on um, common law, on, uh, yeah, on agreeing about the substance of, of COVID-19. Is it a real crisis and how to deal with it? Uh, the society seems deeply, deeply, deeply divided and in the end dysfunctional um, about so many things. Do you agree with that diagnosis or don't you? Well, I would say, thank goodness that the Founding Fathers gave us federalism. Mm -hmm. Because while it is true that it's hard to get some things done in Washington, the states go right ahead, making policy, making good decisions. Uh, we have a very vibrant civil society, usually that works at the local level to do things that Washington uh, cannot. Uh, I actually am one who believes Washington tries to do too much. Uh, if you let Washington do foreign policy and entitlement reform, which we do need, and uh, federal tax policy and a few other things, and let the states worry about job training and education and a whole range of issues, because what it takes to do these things in California and Alabama and Texas and Vermont, we are a big and very diverse country. And so government at the level closest to the people is the most effective. It's a very interesting fact that if you ask people about Congress, their, their views of Congress are very, very bad. If you ask about your specific Congress person, they like that person yeah, that because they know that they have control. So um, I, I do think Washington is sometimes dysfunctional. We get some things done. Uh, we have to remember, too, that sometimes there are differences in policy. You know, you mentioned the COVID response. Um, there's been this, listen to the scientist. I believe in listening to the scientist. But we also know that the COVID response just can't be epidemiology because there are real costs to learning loss for children not being in school. There are mental health issues. We have people in the United States who are not going to a doctor and realize that they haven't therefore been uh, screened for, for cancers that, that show up then too late to do anything about it. And so these were legitimate debates about how to respond to COVID-19, how much to lock down, how much to allow the economy to come back. And they're sometimes uh, portrayed as Democrat against Republicans. This is another case where governors were making decisions based on their specific circumstances. You know, I'm sure you know that Jim Mattis, the former defense secretary, said that Donald Trump uh, was the first president um, who does not even try to unite the country, but divide it further, meaning um, increase the polarization we, we've just been talking about. Is Jim Mattis wrong about that? Well, Jim Mattis is one of my dear friends, um, mm -hmm. and he had his views. Uh, my own view is that our, our polarization has been there for a while. And um, there are different uh, factors in that. I, I mentioned the way we get our information. I think we are becoming two countries, one coastal and one not. Um, and that's a source of polarization. Uh, I don't think the president has helped uh, with uh, some of his language. He's a kind of combative person, and that certainly doesn't help. Uh, and I would have advised him to use the language of unity more often, not the language of division. But to, uh, to say that that's why we have divisions, I think, is, uh, is not right. Our divisions uh, come from much deeper uh, forces. We need to get back to what it is that unites us. You know, America is a kind of interesting experiment. Uh, we are not united by ethnicity or nationality or religion. To be an American could be to have relatives, to have ancestors who came from Korea, 
To be an American could be a descendant of slaves who came from Africa, uh, a Mexican, Mexicans who crossed the border, uh, Germans who came to the United States. So to be American is to have a creed. It doesn't matter where you came from, it matters where you're going. You can come from humble circumstances and do great things. And we've gotten away from that. We become more tribal. We define ourselves in ever smaller groups. And instead, what we need to get back to is why did we for so many generations, even when, for instance, it wasn't really true for my grandparents, why did we believe that you could come from humble circumstances and do great things? Opportunity, education. If we can get back to Americans really believing that, I think we'll overcome some of these divisions. I, I tried, I couldn't find it online, but I'm sure you have been confronted with your 2016 Facebook post before when you said that Donald Trump should not be president and he should I withdraw. <laughs> I hope to support someone who has the dignity and statue to run the, the highest office in the greatest democracy on earth, you wrote back then. And I'm, I hear you criticize, criticizing him in a diplomatic way. Um, did you fall in line with the other Republicans? Do you think party unity has to be more important? Um, or did he somehow convince you? Um, what, what's, your, um, what's your standpoint today? Well, I believe in democracy. I believe in democratic processes. And when he was elected president, he was my president too. And uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, I actually saw him in the Oval Office uh, in March of 17. Uh, he knew very well what I had said about him. And uh, yet we sat there and he asked me questions about China and he asked me questions about the Baltic states and we had a very uh, good conversation. I always tell people, um, when I want to comment on how I will vote, I will call you. Uh, but um, my view is that when somebody is president, uh, he's president. It doesn't mean you agree or you have to agree because of party line or any such thing. I felt free to criticize policies that I don't agree with. I have felt free to support policies that I do. I completely agreed with pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. Didn't think it was a good deal. I think that what they have done in the Middle East with the UAE and Bahrain recognizing Israel is a major breakthrough. I do not agree with the policies on immigration. I think our great strength is a country of immigrants. So um, I have felt completely free to, because I'm not in the administration, to uh, criticize when I've wanted to and to support when I've wanted to. Do you have the time for a quick second round of... Uh, I, one second, I have to get the lights once more. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a timer. It. Yeah, yes, let's, let's we have that. time for a couple of more questions, yes. I think it's, yeah, I know, the, the darkness, yeah. yes. You know, we, we haven't been in our offices. You have to understand, we've not been in our offices since March, so things may be going a little bit crazy. So anyway. Oh, have you been teaching, Secretary Rice? Have you been teaching remotely from... Home? I have not been teaching because I became director of the Hoover Institution, but a number of my, my a number of my colleagues have, and they're making it work. It's not so easy. And all of it remotely, I guess. Um, yes, all of it remotely. In the classroom, right. yeah. All of it remotely. There's a question from Paul McNiven. I, I hope I pronounced that name correctly. What are your views on the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, uh, the Supreme Court judge? Um, I, I am actually a Notre Dame alumna, uh, so I'm very proud of her in that way. Uh, she seemed in her hearings uh, to be an exceptional jurist, um, to uh, be completely qualified for the court. Um, I want to just say something about that, and so I support her, her nomination and her elevation to the court, um, as I did Brett Kavanaugh, who I know personally quite well. But I want to just say something about the American Supreme Court, because I think it's sometimes uh, misunderstood. Um, Yes, we have some 5-4 decisions, but we have a lot of 7-2 decisions as well. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts has been very clear uh, in trying to make sure that the court is not political, but that it takes into account uh, all sides. And I think our justices also are uh, very much justices who recognize that sometimes there's settled law and that uh, Americans have made decisions based on settled law and expectations of settled law. I hear sometimes, for instance, 
um, all of those gay marriages are going to be overturned because of uh, the Supreme Court. It would be stunning to me if the Supreme Court recognizing that millions of people would be affected. So I think that there's sometimes a, 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 a misunderstanding of our Supreme Court as just another political body. There is something that happens when people put on that robe. And I just uh, believe that uh, any uh, effort to, quote, pack the court, what does that mean? Make it bigger for political purposes will not be terribly well received by Americans because the Supreme Court remains uh, one of the most admired institutions in America, along with the military. What do you tell the, the Democrats who, of course, complain that their attempt to, to fill the, the Supreme Court seat in 2016 uh, was blocked by by Republicans in the Senate. And I, I would say I would simply say that uh, you had you have political bodies, um, and presidents have a right until the moment that they're no longer president to appoint to the court, and uh, to nominate to the court. Uh, and if you can, if you don't have the numbers in the Senate to stop it, that's how the system works. And oh, by the way, at that time there was a Republican Senate. So, you know, I, I know it may, sound really? a little, it may sound a little rough and tumble, but that's actually what the Founding <laughs> Fathers built in when they built in separation of powers. So thank you very much. This is yes. Realpolitik, and I sh I'm sure you know the term. Secretary Rice, one final question. What is your opinion on the state of the race, uh, the, the presidential race? Of course, German, the German audience wants to know. Is it already over? Is it past well, I could, I, could, I could say, Klaus, I'm, I am a specialist in international politics, not American <laughs> politics. But um, I will just say, I don't, uh, but all of us should be careful about polls. Um, they, I, it's clearly, Vice President Biden is well ahead in the polls. Uh, some people don't know of how large the, quote, hidden Trump vote is. Um, and so we will see. And of course, the national polls, the, the national race doesn't matter. This really comes down to a few states. And uh, nobody really knows, I think, how COVID-19 will affect all of this. I'm just hoping uh, that we will have uh, a victor on uh, that night. Um, I am a little bit concerned. I'm a veteran of Bush v. v. Gore, but uh, we were a, a different country in 2000, and both Bush and Gore went home, did not try to stir up the circumstances. Uh, we have a lot of politicians these days who I think might take advantage of that, mm -hmm. and so my hope is that um, we, have a, we have a winner, and we can declare that on the, the, that Wednesday, uh, and whoever it is will be president of the United States and we can get on with it. Yeah, I share that hope with you. Um, it would be terrible if it drags on forever and ever. Yes. yes. Rise, it's been an honor, it's been a pleasure, and thank yes, you sir. for your very frank answers. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you. Secretary Rice, um, Mr. Brinkbäumer, also on behalf of America's Northern Westphalia, an honor to have you. Thank you so much for these words and the discussion. Thanks, thanks a lot to the Otto Wolf Foundation and everyone in the audience. A vibrant discussion. And thanks to my great team, especially Katarina Kiefel, who handled everything in the background. Now, all of you, if you're interested in our programs, um, this concludes our um, annual Otto Wolf lecture. It is our, now Secretary um, uh, Rice left. <laughs> That's totally okay. So uh, I, I won't have to shorten my words now. This concludes this year's Otto Wolf lecture. It is our annual highlight lecture, uh, which honors the late Alfred von Oppenheim and Otto Wolf von Amerongen. These were two friends dedicated to fostering transatlantic relations. And I think this sums it up. This is actually what America's Northern Westphalia is all about. Out. And we have a lot of events coming up in the near future before, on, and after the US election, and of course beyond. If you're interested, just have a look at our website, america-nrw.de. And now I'll leave it at that. I wish all of you um, all the best and health to you and your families. Again, Mr. Blinkbäumer, thank you so much. Good night and goodbye. Thank you.